a pilgrimage to Hawkinge Airfield near Folkestone. In 1940, the Battle of Britain pilots would have looked out of these windows of the Scramble Hut at the grass runway with its notorious dip and almost across to France where the enemy was mustering for invasion. The runway is gone now, long since ploughed up, and soon part of the old frontline base will, perhaps ironically, be turned into a youth adventure centre. But until the new intake arrives, Hawkinge will remain a quite extraordinary memorial, a ghost airfield almost frozen in the days of spitfires, hurricanes and defiance, and that unique spirit of 1940. Far to the north at Biggin Hill, another memorial. One of the most famous and vital fighter bases, now a small, busy airport. Battle of Britain historian Derek Wood showed me some of its undisturbed corners. This is a part of a dispersal. Um, every squadron was dispersed on the airfield. You could use these blast pens to protect you from bombing while you did minor maintenance, or the aircraft was just kept here. At readiness, you'd have them all lined up on the airfield here with the trolley accumulators ready to start them. Uh, people ready to um, get the harness on the aircraft, get the parachutes on them, seat them in the aircraft. And you'd, of course, have a refueling uh, vehicle, probably rushing down the other end if there was a raid on. Not a nice thing to be in. In the evening, while the daytime fighter pilots were resting, some of the comparatively unsung heroes were sitting in dark glasses to accustom their eyes to night duties. Wing Commander Ted Wolfe's logbook details many of those encounters with the enemy. In defiance and bow fighters, they went up to chase away the marauding bombers. Mr Wolfe, that book must bring back a few memories, I should think. Yes, it certainly does. Some are quite amusing and some are quite exciting. I was shot at once or twice by our own anti-aircraft. The uh, naval Chatham guns um, were very uh, touchy and I don't blame them and they used to let off at us every now and again if we got too close to them, which was fair enough. And then a rather excitable um, people manning searchlights and anti-aircraft just south of Gravesend Aerodrome. They loosed off at four of us one night when we were climbing in cloud. And it is reported that the uh, officer in charge of that particular battery was none other than uh, Lieutenant Edward Heath. But we don't know for certain whether it was our recent Prime Minister. <laughs> and then to cap it all, um, one of the pilot officers of my flight came back having been beaten up by three hurricanes. And uh, he landed successfully on his good starboard engine. <laughs> Very cross. <laughs> This myth of the RAF pilot popping up to shoot a few Hun down, was it as casual as that? No, no way. That's probably Lord Dowling's greatest achievement, was that he created the, the world's first organised air defence system. It, when you look back on it, we treat it as commonplace now, but it was fantastic. He'd actually organised a complete network which could report with radar um, to sea, the observer corps inland, everywhere in the country. Uh, it was almost indestructible in a way because you could always plug the links in the chain. You'd got subsidiary airfields. If this airfield was very badly bombed, you could always say, well, I'll send the fighters somewhere else. It was a total jigsaw puzzle, and he fitted all the pieces in from 1936 onwards and made an incredible job of it. 
Someone, of course, had to clear the awful carnage of war. Ground staff like James Taylor doing the grimmest of jobs for the men they respected. How did you feel about the people who were flying? The, the... Well, they were a great lot. They, re they really were. The, and, the, and, the, and the flight crews, I mean, they re worked like beavers, to, you know, to refuel an aircraft after it had come in and done a, a stint. You see the uh, fairly limited um, fuel supply on that uh, type of aircraft. The, um, and that sort of thing. So they had to, uh, I think they had not much over an hour's uh, duration, but they had to come in and refuel and perhaps rearm uh, and off again. They were, you know, pretty badly pushed. The clearers, cleaners and checkers, the firemen, ARPs and observers all quietly played a vital part in the battle. So did the factory workers. Spitfire chief test pilot Alex Henshaw recalls the spirit at the Vickers aircraft works. The people of Britain in those days and the spirit that prevailed has never been recognised by the generation of today. Uh, they would work, if necessary, 24 hours a day, but not only work 24 hours a day, under the most appalling conditions, appalling in the sense of weather, appalling in the way they live their lives, appalling in the sense of enemy destruction, appalling in the sense that they were losing loved ones overseas in the armed services. And if we had that spirit prevailing through our country today, then we would be leading the world without any efforts from Mrs Thatcher. Looking back now, everybody thinks, oh, yes, it must have been easy, but, but in those days, nobody knew what it was going to be like, and we were unproven. What was it like? What, what did the sky look like when the, it was full of bombers? Not very nice. You ran like mad to the nearest shelter, if you could. Um, it didn't come about... Only the large raids on London, the very big ones, where it literally you could see them stepped up for miles. In most cases, suddenly it would all happen. This is only as someone who was young and on the ground. You'd look up, and where there hadn't been a squadron, there was a dogfight going on, then another squadron. And a few minutes later, the sky was clear. You'd see one or two shot down. And most of the pilots found this one minute they'd be um, sweating their, their guts out, fighting like mad. And the next second, there were nobody there. Let's face it, we were, we were fighting a battle in three dimensions, up there, across there, and around there. It's rather different. It's the first three-dimensional battle of all time, really.